What do you get when you combine art, math, and ancient wisdom? Find out next on The Leadership Voice. Welcome to The Leadership Voice. I'm your host, Jay Barbuto. Joining us today is a renowned thought leader, Robert Edward Grant. We have a lot of great things to explore, so let's start things off with the quote of the day. Today's quote is from one of the great polymaths, Leonardo da Vinci. Study the science of art, Study the art of science, develop your senses, especially learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. Joining us today is Robert Edward Grant, a successful entrepreneur, best-selling author, prolific inventor, and founder of several corporate enterprises. He is the founder, chairman, and managing partner of Strasby Crown, a growth equity holding company with a broad portfolio spanning healthcare, clean energy, social media, and financial technology. A true modern day polymath. It is an honor to welcome Robert Grant. Hi, great to be here. Robert, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank and, you. And coming on. We're really excited to learn more about the different projects you're working on and your business philosophies as well as your leadership philosophies. Too. Sure. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go ahead and start things off and talk a little bit about Codex. Okay. This, the, tell us about how this got started, this project. So Egyptology has always been kind of a passion of mine, but I never really thought it would turn into something like it now has. I was on a trip and hosting about 50 people in Egypt in 2020, and it was a discovery mission. We were following clues left to us by Leonardo da Vinci in his paintings about Egypt. So he had three years of his life that was missing from historical records in Italy. And I found the references that actually suggest that he was in Egypt during that time. There's also lots of different symbologies in his paintings uh, that include Egyptian sort of symbols, et cetera. So I was sort of very curious about this. We followed this clue. And while I was there, I got uh, reached out to by a group that was representing the History Channel. And History Channel basically said, we'd like to buy out your show, right? Because they knew I had cameras there. I was filming and documenting the whole thing, but I wasn't planning on making a film out of it just yet. I was just thinking I need to document it and keep it. And, uh, and then they wanted to have kind of total control over the show, content, et cetera, creative control. They wanted to be more like a reality type show, like Oak Island or something. And I couldn't really do that. So I said, I, I, I kind of refused. And I got another offer from Gaia, uh, which is a streaming television network. And they said, look, we'll give you total creative control. And so I went for it and Codex is now a reality. It's a television show available on Gaia and on Amazon Prime. And it's about this exact thing, following these encryptions left in the paintings by Leonardo da Vinci and other Rosicrucian Renaissance period scholars and polymaths that lead back to the Giza Plateau in particular. And so if a person were, were watching the episode, uh, the, the show, what kinds of things are they gonna take away from the experience? Well, I think they're gonna get a different relationship with mathematics, first of all, because the only thing that we really have left by the builders that is still in living stone is the architecture itself. You know, the Great Pyramid is famous for not having any writing on it. There's no hieroglyphs inside. Uh, there's nothing that we could easily point to and say, okay, this is when it was built, this is how it was built, and this is why it was built. But actually what we can derive through the mathematics of it is that there are some really, really important aspects that lead you to kind of ask some big, big, almost existential style questions. Why is it that the latitude of the Great Pyramid, for example, is the speed of light? 29.9792458 is the speed of light, and that is the exact reference from a geodetic sort of coordinate perspective for the latitude of the Great Pyramid. Why is the longitude one over pi, for example? So that sort of says, wait a minute, there's some sort of like much higher knowledge here that may be embedded in our understanding of, of why these pyramids would have been built, uh, what was their purpose, and exactly, you know, when were they built and who built them? So the, these things couldn't possibly be total coincidences. Well, one thing I've learned through life 
is that, you know, a lot of people believe in randomness. And I even created a random number generator in one of my entrepreneurial ventures, which achieved the highest level of randomness and uniform distribution that we know of today in the world. But I could say that I also don't really believe in true randomness. I believe that randomness is really just the boundary condition of our knowledge. And it's where our knowledge ends and our ignorance begins. So it doesn't mean that it's not pattern, it just might be too big a pattern for us to be able to zoom out and see. But the pattern is actually potentially there. Terrific, so if you were to think about the many moments, uh, you've so far you've filmed one season? Se filmed season one and we're about to film season two probably later this year. So if we look back at season one of Codex, what would be your, f if you can, what would be your favorite moment? It could be your favorite discovery, but what would be your favorite moment of season one? So I would say it's actually a part where my wife discovered, uh, she was in the pyramid with us, and she discovered on the wall, um, I had discovered the Alpha Omega that was basically debossed into the rim of the sarcophagus that no one had ever seen before. And Alpha and Omega has symbolism beyond Greek language. In fact, it's probably from a lone, you know, these are probably lone letters from a much older language, potentially. But the Alpha Omega that's on the sarcophagus rim is actually a reference to the Apis bull and the Hathor, which are two very important references of Osiris and Isis, right? And so when my wife discovered on the wall a cow, a very large cow, and a bull inside that cow, uh, which was a smaller version like the sun, this was actually a reference directly to, it was etched right into the wall, that, but very difficult to see. And then when you see it, you can't unsee it. Right When she discovered that and we captured all of that on film, it was just completely real time. And that showed up in Codex. And that's probably my favorite part of the show because you know, we've now discovered that there are petroglyphs all over the walls. And if you know where to find them and what their reference point is, they're all telling the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Osiris, which is the major you know, person in the Egyptian pantheon. In the Greek pantheon, he would have been considered Zeus. But in the Egyptian pantheon, he was this person who was killed by his brother and then resurrected. And through this process of resurrection, got to become a god again. And, um, and it's kind of a fascinating story because it also tells the story of the Egyptian history. So as we think about this, this, this project, and it's an amazing project, mm -hmm. what would be, in your mind, the, the best takeaway that viewers can, can have from this project? I think that there's a whole world out there that maybe we haven't perceived just yet. There's another aspect to ourselves that maybe we can tap into and, and gain a higher awareness and understanding of. And it doesn't have to be, you know, we look at mathematics as being the queen of the sciences. And most people think it's the most objective. That's why it's the queen of the sciences, right? It's the thing that everyone can bank on, but it's also the seat of the most esoteric and sort of spiritual aspects also. You know, people use numerology and it's embedded right into astrology as well. And lots of people believe in that. So on the one hand, we see it as the most objective science, but on the other, you've got numerology, which also seems like the most kind of out there, right? Mystic and esoteric of the sciences. So what is it really? And is it potentially both? You know, we live in this world where we think we're stuck in, I'm right and you're wrong, but actually, if we can expand our viewpoint, we might actually come to understand why it is that when there's a crime and there are 30 eyewitnesses, everyone has an entirely different account of what happened. Because it's all different perspectives. Because it's all different perspectives. We see the world, not as it is, but as we are, and we see it from our own vantage point. And I, actually, I, I like to actually refer to that as our own advantage point. Whatever we want to see is what we ultimately do see. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for talking about sure. the, this, this project. So what would be next for Codex? So we're going to be filming season two, and I'm excited for it. You know, I'm putting it all together right now. And, you know, you'd be surprised because this is such a passion for us. We did the last filming session we did took four days, and it was, you know, nine episodes. We actually started out making 13 episodes, but we truncated it down to nine episodes. And we did it all in a single take. So we didn't do any extra takes because we just knew this stuff, our team just knew it so inside out, backwards and forwards, because we're not doing this because it's a job, we're doing it because it's a passion, it's fun. And when things are fun for us, 
And I think that's been a theme in life as well. You know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So this has just been a pure fun project that now has sort of ballooned into something way bigger. You know, I was looking at the number of um, just the trailer views now are approaching 10 million just on the trailer, which, you know, put that in context. If you look at how many, you know, views there are on Handmaid's Tales trailer and, you know, famous shows that are on streaming television, they're not really in that zone. So I'm like kind of blown away at the response that it's gotten so far. And I just hope that it helps people see things a slightly different way and maybe increase empathy for how other people might see things. That's terrific. So maybe just uh, tell, our, tell our viewers, where, else, where, can they, where can they find and watch Codex? Well, you can go. Uh, you can go to Gaia, right? And so you can download Gaia. It's an app. Uh, there's a lot of great programs on Gaia. Uh, it's worth worth having. I think it's a great uh, sort of platform. It's around uh, mainly around wellness and mindfulness and things like this. And and then on Amazon Prime. So if you have Amazon, you can go and just look up Code X. It's two words, Code X. And, um, and just look it up on Amazon and you'll find it and you can purchase it right there. Terrific. Well, thank you, Robert, for talking to us thank about you. this project. We're going to come on here in just a few minutes and we're going to talk more about your, the entrepreneurial side mm -hmm. of some of the things you've been working on. And then later we'll talk about leadership as well. Perfect. Thank Perfect. you. It's now time for a feature segment of the Leadership Voice. It's today's Did You Know? Today's Did You Know? comes from business.adobe.com. Nearly three in four global executives believe a lack of skills is an issue facing their industry. And 64% say this talent deficit restricts innovation. We may be approaching an innovation recession. It's now time for our leadership countdown. Today's countdown comes from observer.com. According to observer.com, a polymath is someone that develops expertise in three or more diverse domains, and then integrates them into a unique skill set. We all should be polymaths. Today we count down the top seven entrepreneurial advantages of being a polymath. Number seven, it helps you stand out and compete in the global economy. Number six, it sets you up to solve more complex problems. Number five, it future-proofs your career. The number four advantage of being a polymath is that it's easier than ever to pioneer a new field, industry, or skill set. Number three, it's easier and faster than ever to become competent in a new skill. Number two, most creative breakthroughs come via making atypical combinations of skills. And the number one advantage of being a polymath is creating an atypical combination of two or more competent skills can lead to a world-class skill set. Stick around. We'll be right back with Robert Grant after this short break. The Bringing Learning to Work program is our way of connecting the faculty of Cal State Fullerton with the business community of Orange County and Southern California. We have over 72 training programs that are available via distance or face-to-face. -face. And the faculty come to your company and they deliver the training to your employees. The Bringing Learning to Work program is really fundamentally, it's leadership programming. We do diversity and emotional intelligence training. We partner with Cal State Fullerton because they had subject matter experts in these fields. Um, and we're really fortunate and privileged to be able to do that. Many companies can't afford training and development personnel. And so this is a great opportunity to leverage Cal State's faculty to help them develop their learning programs. The leadership of the center and the students allow me to not only bring leadership development to my company, but allow me to interact with some amazing students who have grit, potential and just amazing futures in front of them and I get to take part of that. It's a wonderful feeling. When your organization is ready to develop its talent, reach out to the Center for Leadership and we'll help get you there. Welcome back to the Leadership Voice. Let's continue our conversation with Robert Grant. Robert, Hi. welcome back. Hi, good to be back. All right, so let's talk about business. Let's talk about business and investing. 
Tell us about the first company you ever started. You know, it's kind of a funny story behind this. I remember I got back from uh, living in Korea for two years and I was broke. And I called my parents and I said, mom, I need some money. Can you send me some money for my tuition? And she said, no. And I was like, we've all been in those situations, right? And literally I was so poor at the time. I used to buy, this is really nasty to sound like this, but I used to buy six foot long sandwiches and then cut off a bit of it and eat it every day. Like that was life for me, right? That and ramen, that's basically what I had. I was so poor. And, and so she said, well, you're gonna have to get innovative you're gonna have to figure out what you're gonna to do to make money to go to school. And tuition was due soon. So I remember going to one of the basketball games at my university, I went to BYU, and the basketball arena there was huge, like 28,000 people there. And I noticed that the seats weren't filled up. And when I was in high school, I'd done telemarketing when I was like 15 years old, because I was like, you know, they couldn't tell how old I was. And this was like a sweatshop of a telemarketing job too. It paid well. But every night they would fire one person out of the row, the lowest person, whatever the lowest person was, and there was a board, you know, there was like a scoreboard up on each of the rows of the tables of all the people doing telemarketing. It was basically selling insurance. It was like the worst job. But I remember thinking, well, you know, maybe I could convince the school to let me call the alumni lists and basically see if we could sell more basketball season tickets to the alumni organization, right? Any of the members of the people that had gone to school there before. And so um, I pitched it. And the guy that was running it was a guy by the name of Mike Cutell. And Mike later went on to become the manager for the Utah Jazz. So like he was, became a big time guy. And I pitched to him and here I was just this, you know, 21 year old kid walking into him saying, okay, I wanna basically set up, cause you have inbound telemarketing during the day. I wanna set up nighttime outbound telemarketing, use all the same infrastructure. You don't need to put any capital investment into it and just give me the alumni list and we're gonna sell different levels of parking passes and different levels of sort of status. There was like a gold pass and a platinum pass and stuff that I kind of came up with. I hired 13 of my close friends and he said, well, how much do you wanna make if you do this? And I said, well, uh, I don't wanna make a salary. And so he said, he said, well, the salary is like $5 an hour type of thing. I said, okay, you can pay me $5 an hour, but I want 20% of the profit, so at risk instead of making more than just minimum wage, because $5 is a minimum wage at the time. And, and so he finally said, okay, you could do it. So I said, I get 20% of the profit of whatever we get by the time we stop this in two months. He said, yes. And <laughs> two months later, I was the highest paid person on campus. Really? <laughs> because we ended up selling out. It just sold really well. I happened to be lucky also because the team did super well that year. So everyone was keen to start getting tickets to the basketball games and everything. And it was, you know, we were in the top five nationwide. So the thing just like blew up. And all of a sudden I had the money to pay for school. And it was kind of like a great experience because even though everyone told me that it was going to be impossible, right? I just said, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to figure it out. I'll fake it till I make it if I have to but I'm gonna make it successful. And having that experience definitely set the stage for a lot more similar experiences. Sometimes I failed, but usually even when I failed, I would fall up somehow. And I'm gonna be writing a book soon called Falling Up, which I think is something that all of us can do. You've had the opportunity to, to start, found several businesses. You've also invested in many types of businesses. So how do you decide is it always your idea? I mean, how do you decide what is going to be a good business? You know what? One thing I've noticed and learned, I think, is that ideas are dime a dozen. And a lot of people get stuck on the belief that the idea is the whole thing. I've had many ideas that, you know, unfortunately, I haven't all brought them all to fruition. I have founded like 11 companies now. But the thing is, is that what you really bet behind is not the idea. You bet behind the people. I can't ever bet behind ideas. I have to bet behind people. And when you realize that everything comes down to that person's ability and how they see themselves, most importantly, you know, Socrates said, know thyself. It's probably the most important thing we will ever do. But most people don't realize that it's probably the most difficult thing we'll ever do. We are not able to see behind us. We're not able, we don't have eyes in the back of our head. There are ways we can expand our awareness and increase it through like 360 degree process reviews, et cetera. But 
The truth is, we can't really see all aspects of ourselves. But the more we're able to expand our understanding of ourselves, the more self-aware we become, the more successful we are in any activity that we undertake. Because we realize what are the things that trigger us and bring us to start thinking in terms of fear versus thinking in terms of abundance. When you think in terms of abundance, everything becomes very intentional. So I like to try to bet behind people, whether they're my ideas or someone else's ideas, that have already that way of looking at the world. That it's, there's an aspect of it that might be, you know, nature and nurture, the combination thereof. But then there's an aspect of it that might also associate with how they're working with your team and how they work with you. So if you think about the different companies that you've um, founded, uh, which, which has made you the, the most proud? For all the companies that I have helped to found and to invest behind, you know, all of those teams, each one of them have done such an amazing job. And one of our companies is now the second largest healthcare lender in the United States. Uh, one of our companies is vying for number two position in the neurotoxin market in, in healthcare, right? Competing against Botox. And, you know, has grown very rapidly. Another one is soon to be in a similar position on the therapeutic side. So we have all these different companies, but one of the companies that I'm probably most enthusiastic about its long-term potential, it's our cryptography company. And that is uh, Crown Sterling. So Crown Sterling is basically a cryptocurrency business that utilizes quantum resistant encryption. And it allows people to be able to capture all their own data. And if they want to, they never have to sell it and no one can capture it from them. It's all encrypted with quantum resistance with a quantum VPN technology, which then allows you to have an NFT. And if you want to sell your data, you can. Because I believe that's the first opportunity humanity will have, now that data is the most valuable asset in the world, to actually have a sustainable universal basic income. That's an amazing thing to be proud of. So I have to ask though, uh, mistakes. Oh, so many. What's the biggest mistake you've made and what did you learn from that? Gosh. You know, it's like if I look back, I'll, I'll tell you, I used to work at Allergan. I was president of Allergan Medical, so I got to launch products like Juvederm and Lapban and Latisse and really dramatically expand you know, products across the market like Botox, right? And Botox is a huge, huge product, huge name. And I ended up getting recruited by Warburg Pincus, a large private equity fund, and I had intended to, you know, to be CEO of Bausch & Lomb Surgical. So we, we were gonna spin out the Bausch & Lomb Surgical unit, right, which is about half the company approximately. And um, my business had been underperforming for a long time, so I was coming in as a turnaround leader and then we're gonna take that public. And I was really had my heart set on that. And what happened was I realized that once a business is turned around, nobody wants to spin it out. So all of a sudden, there's plenty of suitors that want to buy it. And there was a company called Valiant who wanted to buy it, and they ultimately ended up buying it. And so when I learned that my hopes were dashed, right, and I had left this really great job at Allergan, right, as president of Allergan Medical, I was like kind of really depressed for a moment. And I remember the next morning I woke up, and the night before I flew home from, I flew home from New York after a meeting where I learned all this, I threw up on the airplane. It was horrible. I felt like like lower than low. I was like, you know, whale excrement at the bottom of what the ocean. What did I do? It, what am I going to do? What, what a huge mistake I made. And here I was only 41 years old at the time. And I ended up going out the next morning feeling depressed. I was going to go pick up the newspaper when we still had newspapers. It was back in 2000. You know, it was back in 2011. And as I reached down to pick up the newspaper, I remember thinking for that just instant, this could either be the best day of my life or the worst day of my life. It's my choice. And I decided right then, damn it, it's gonna be the best day of my life. So I reached down, picked up the paper, and right after that is when I decided to start my company that I've now been leading and managing for the last 10 years. So in those moments, and, and we all have those moments, uh, what you declare mm -hmm. can really change the whole course. Oh, yeah, it's... Life is not about what happens to you. We all get stuck in this perception that we believe we're the sum total of all the victimhood or all the you know, happenstance that happened to us, right? That's not what it is. Life is what you perceived happened to you. Life is what you believe happened to you and what you will likely believe will happen to you. So when you put it in that context, you can flip any negative situation into a positive one. 
if you determine that that's actually the outcome you intend to observe. And this isn't just me saying this, this is actually a, a, an artifact of physics. This is a fact, right, of physics. It's called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And in quantum physics, it's exactly real. You can actually affect the outcome of an experiment simply through observation of that experiment and what you determine is your observation of it. Danger is real, but fear is a choice. And if we can choose how the outcome is going to be perceived by us, we can have a massive impact on actually what we experienced. A lot of our viewers are gonna to wanna to know this. Is how do you go from an idea to a company that's monetizing? You know, it's funny. John F. Kennedy said, um, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the very best of our energies and skills. Because that task is one that we're willing to accept, one that we're unwilling to postpone, and one that we intend to win. He said that in 1962. He sealed it, of course, later with his life. What's interesting is how the heck did NASA figure out, and now we can't even go back to the moon, that's the funny part about this. Although they did just announce the Artemis program, which I think is pretty funny because it was Apollo, now it's Artemis. Okay, so the female gets to go back to the moon now. What's great about this though, is that as an example, is that an entire industry was born. The whole medical device and a lot of the tech industry in Southern California was born out of the Apollo space program. Do you know dialysis as technology came out of this? Do you know pacemakers came out of this? Because they were looking at it from the perspective of beginning with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So if we're going to live up to this vision of John F. Kennedy, that within this decade, we will land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. The first thing you have to think about is, well, there's no gravity on the moon, so how is he gonna land on the moon? And if he's gonna walk on the face of the moon, how can he walk on the moon when there's no gravity? Well, we need a gravity boot. Start with the end in mind and work backwards. With anything that you do that you want to materialize, you have to start thinking about it in terms of as, it all, as if it already existed. As if, now of course, you have to manage expectations. You can't sit there and say, oh, I look at all the stuff I already have that you don't really have yet. But in your mind, you have to thread the needle to be able to perceive it in your own mind as if it does already exist. And so when you're able to do that successfully, then you can move mountains. You can literally move mountains and get your entire team to be thinking backwards, beginning with the end in mind and working backwards to where you are today. And that's probably the most important technique I've seen great managers and great leaders employ. That's terrific. Robert, we're gonna take a short break and we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about your leadership philosophies. Sure. Perfect. It's now time for our leadership example. Today's leadership example comes from CNBC.com. Here are the top 25 disruptive technology companies for 2022. now time for our leadership lesson. Today I will be talking about leading with integrity. I'm Dr. Jay Barbuto and here is today's leadership lesson. Today I'm going to talk with you about integrity and how it impacts leadership. In fact, what I'm going to tell you today is a surefire way of creating and maintaining trust and respect from your team as well as the most destructive ways that a leader can lose both. The key to earning, building, and keeping the trust and respect of others is to be a person of integrity. So what makes us a person with integrity? Is it about being honest or, or ethical? No, it's actually much simpler than that. 
Being a person of integrity is about honoring your word. Every time you give your word, you are placing your integrity at risk. Leaders need to carefully consider the cost and benefit of giving your word. Because once given, you must honor it. So what does it mean to honor your word? Honoring your word can take place in two ways. The first way to honor your word is to keep your word. If you say you are going to do something by a certain date or time, do it. Your word needs to mean something. If whenever you give your word, you keep it, people will start to value your word. But if you do not keep your word, it signals to others. If you do not keep your word, it signals to others that you lack integrity. The second way to honor your word when you know you will not keep your word is to stay accountable for your word. Staying accountable for your word requires you to communicate immediately to those affected the moment you know that you will not be keeping your word and make things right. This means letting others know right away, not after the fact. Too many in this world will tell someone after the fact, sorry I'm late, my meetings ran late, my day got away from me, and other excuses that are given after the fact without reconciliation. Broken promises and excuses are often given to others when not keeping our word. These instances lead to a disintegration of one's integrity. To stay accountable for your word, you must communicate immediately instances where you have given your word but cannot keep it. Not keeping your word will cause negative outcomes. You may have others waiting. You may have work getting bottlenecked. You may have others counting on you, expecting you to deliver. So if you will not be keeping your word, you need to make things right. You need to clean up your mess. You need to fix whatever negative outcome not keeping your word has caused. Stay accountable and you can still honor your word. If you're a leader that lacks integrity, the game is over. You've lost. So you must honor your word because a word given will speak volumes to your integrity and impact every relationship in which you give it. I'm Dr. Jay Barbuto, and this has been your Leadership Lesson. And there we have our Leadership Lesson. Let's continue our conversation with Robert Grant. <laughs> thanks, Jay. Robert, thanks for staying with us. We're going to talk about your leadership uh, philosophies and, and, and help our viewers develop some of their own uh, perspectives of leadership. Can we start maybe talk about and share your leadership philosophy? So I, you know, I, I think this is one of those things that is so often missed, that there's a difference between management and leadership. So often people will say, we manage things, but we lead people. And I think that's very true. If you actually polled people and said, do you like to work for a manager or do you like to lead, work for a leader? Most people would say, nobody wants to work for a manager, right? Why is that? Because they don't want to be micromanaged. They don't want to be told what to do all the time. But there are some important skills that are necessary from a management perspective. Above and beyond all the things, the ticket to the game is you went to MBA school or you went to business school or whatever, and you kind of know four pieces of marketing and you kind of generally know all the stuff about finances and hopefully ABC accounting, you figure that part out. But what you really need to understand is that successful businesses from a management perspective need to have a manager who is able and adept at three in particular things. Number one, it's focus. Focus, focus, focus. Lots of people will come up with tons and tons of ideas, but they can easily get derailed if they don't stay focused on the main thing. So I used to have a boss who said to me, keep the main thing, the main thing. And it took me a while to really learn and embody that. But once I finally did, then it was like, geez, okay, keep the main thing, the main thing. As organizations grow, they require different skill sets. And as they grow, surprisingly, they can't do more than just a few things. I know it sounds kind of funny. Whenever someone says to me, oh, they weren't able to get something programmed, and then I ask them, how much money do they have? Oh, we had plenty of money. And I ask them, how many engineers did you have? Or how many marketeers do you have? The larger your teams are, strangely, the less you'll get done. I know this sounds completely paradoxical, but I'm telling you my you know, 53 years old and 30 years of business has told me that that is exactly fact. And lots of people make that error. Right? If it can't scale at a small scale, it can't scale. So keep the main thing the main thing. That's focus. Number two is be able to anticipate. 
what comes around the corner. You can't always have plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, because if you're always focused on plan B and plan C and plan D, you're just gonna create that and manifest that in your world. It's like if I'm skiing down a mountain and I keep focusing on the tree that I might hit, I'll probably run into the tree, right? Don't focus on the tree, focus on where you wanna go. Yeah, you'll right? ski towards it. But you still should have some contingencies. Don't be stupid at the same time, right? So realize that things might come up around the corner and have contingencies for just in case scenarios, but don't put so much focus on them. Remember, we should look at the world with the same percentage as we look at a, through a windshield and then through the rearview mirror, right? We're not driving forward, constantly looking through the rearview mirror, right? We want to have, you know, there's a reason why the rearview mirror is this big and the windshield is this big, right? We should keep it in that proportion. So, but being able to anticipate things will really help when you've got major turbulence in markets that come up like we're about to see, or we've been seeing in the last few months in particular. We're going into a stagflationary environment. That's a new beast for us since 1981. I remember when my parents bought a house in the UK on an 18% interest rate, right? That's really kind of crazy, especially when you've got no growth in the gross domestic product also. But we've printed so much money, this is what the world we are in now. So what we can do though is companies that are able to adapt and change in turbulent times, catapult forward. One third do better during recessionary environments and two thirds go away so or do worse, right? So this is really this anticipation aspect that's important. And the third aspect is being able to measure. These are all management principles. Keep the main thing the main thing, focus your operation on the one or two things that it can do and achieve. Secondly, anticipate the future. And third, be able to measure results. You need to have metrics and measurement. What we measure gets done. It's something called the Hawthorne effect. If you wanna lose weight and you never decide to step on a scale, guess what? It's really hard to lose weight. Once you start stepping on a scale, you now have a metric that you're measuring every day and just by measuring it daily, you start seeing placebo type results, right? Placebo is probably the best drug that there ever has been because it works for everything. That's what I'm saying. Belief actually has a big difference in the outcomes. But when you turn to leadership, it's something altogether different. So focus, adaptability, and measure. Yeah, well, focus and uh, adaptability and, through anticipation and measurement. But leadership is different. Leadership to me is number one, conveying confidence in a future with very, very high degree of detail of vision of what that future state is. You can telegraph that to everybody. You don't have to do it through your voice. You can even do it just through your presence. They know that you see some sort of vision that's very detailed in your mind and they want to catch into that thing, whatever that thing is. Well, the second thing that is leadership is being an example that other people want to follow. It's not good enough to say, do as I say, right? It's got to be do as I do. And you don't even have to say do if you really are doing it because people want to please. In general, people want to please you. There are some rare exceptions to that, but if you actually become an embodiment of that example that you'd like to see in the organization, then you can be the change you wanna see in the world. You can be that change in your own management team also. And then the third aspect of, of leadership is setting high expectations for your organization. Believe in your people more than they believe in themselves and make sure they know it. So there's nothing more powerful than you can do as a leader than to tell someone, I trust you. Because if I said to you, you know what, I know you got this, I trust you. How's that gonna make you feel? Completely empowered. Empowered, and what's more, you're not gonna to wanna to disappoint me also. No. Because it's kind of that same thing, you know, it's like we don't wanna disappoint our father or our mother, right, so very often. It's because we know that they love us more than we probably love ourselves. And, and geez, you know, if I've got a leader who actually sees me in a light, they see and believe in me more than maybe I believe in myself, there's something I can learn here. Maybe I'd like to become the embodiment of how they see me also, right? Because they, they place me on this pedestal almost. Don't place yourself on a pedestal, place everyone else on a pedestal. Everyone should see themselves on pedestals, but not entitled. There's a big difference there. And I think that when you make these delineations between leadership and management, but you are adept at both sides of these things. You can be highly, highly effective as a leader. Yeah, I love that, I love that. So let's talk about 
uh, leadership and leading teams and leading leading organizations and, and the people involved. Because earlier you said that it's the people that really drive the business and and it's the people that make the difference whether or not a company is really going to realize its its mm -hmm. its idea or its mm -hmm. concept. So, how do you build your team? How do you decide who you want on your team? Well, first I I set an intention out there, and I imagine that someone is gonna come and find us, right? That will be the right person. Instead of, I don't like to hire recruiters if I can ever avoid it. We've never had a hard time hiring people in our companies. It's always easy. You know, we place something on LinkedIn or whatever, we end up with lots and lots of resumes and such. The reason is, is because when you have a mission in the company, and particularly today, whether you've got, you know, Gen X, Gen Z, um, you know, Gen Alpha now as well, you look at these different subsets of the population, and they all care about one thing, higher purpose. They all care about higher purpose. If your business is not able, and you as a leader are not able to effectively telegraph that higher purpose through that vision of being able to convey confidence in the future state, you won't be able to succeed with this population, right? So realizing that that's a reality is a very, very critical aspect of success also. So when you're looking at people and you're thinking of adding them to your team and having them join your organization or one of your organizations, you look past just their experiences, don't you? Oh yeah, for me, the ticket to the interview is the fact that they've got the hard skills, right? We all get so focused on the hard skills, but I have this quadrant, you know, two by two grid. It's sort of like back from my consulting days, one that really came out of Jack Welch when he was CEO of GE. He breaks the world down into people with high skill and people with high will. So that would be quadrant one. Quadrant two would be people with low skill but high will, right? Quadrant three would be people with high skill but low will. And quadrant four would be people with low skill and low will. And most companies spend all their time focused on quadrant four. Trying to get those people yeah, to, it's to like move. You should never hire those people. If people have low skill and low will, they shouldn't make it through the interview process. Let's be real, right? But where people often fail is instead of focusing on the left side of the ledger, which would be the high skill, high will people, the superstars, and then the people that are high skill but low will, who are the most dangerous to an organization's culture. And I don't care how good your business idea is, strategy gets crushed by culture because culture eats strategy for breakfast. It eats management teams for lunch and it eats CEOs for dinner. And I can tell you culture is the most important thing for you to manage in your organization. And how do you manage culture? It's through the people that you attract to your organization. It's the nonverbal communication that's happening all the time of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable in your realm, right? So basically the way I look at it is if you can focus on the quadrant one, the people that are the superstars, Make sure that they're rewarded, they're promoted, they're challenged. Those people want to learn. If you're teaching and having them learn and putting them always in steep learning curves, they're going to stick with the organization because they're motivated. They feel like they're learning. Most people leave companies when they A, feel like there's no higher purpose and B, feel like they're no longer learning. The big problem comes into an organization when you have energy vampires. Energy vampires are the people that would be high skill, but low will. These are the people that create tornadoes around them all the time. And in fact, they set themselves up within an organization as being indispensable. Anytime somebody starts saying, oh, that person's brilliant, usually that's another moniker for saying that person is an energy vampire. So you have to be really mindful when you start hearing words like that, right? And the other thing you never want to hear too much of is you as a CEO being quoted all the time around the organization. Oh, Robert said this, Robert said that, Robert said this. That's also not a good sign, right? And if it happens, it could also be just be out of respect, but you go, want to go and speak with that person and say, you know what? You don't need to quote me in this. You have all the authority that you need to basically exercise the effectiveness of your role. But when you start really focusing on getting those people out of the organization, that are in that third quadrant. The fourth quadrant should be taken care of by HR. It should just never even be hired, and if they are, they should just be shuffled out. 
the people that are in the second quadrant are a little bit more challenging. Usually the reason why they're there, these are the people with high will but low skill. Those people are people that you should try anything in your power to hold on to them. Because the moment you take them out of your organization, it starts to destroy your culture. What matters? You're sending the wrong message to the people. Now, it could be that the person there is just not well-trained for the role, right? It could be that they maybe are not suited well for the role also. But that's your job then to try to slot them into another role and have them stay, right? Whereas the people in quadrant th three, either they move up or out. And that's a critical aspect of management, and most people fail, particularly with venture-backed organizations. This is the area that most people fail as entrepreneurs because they don't have the gumption to, to have the tough conversation with the people that are high skill but very low will and are damaging and poisoning the well of their company. I want to change our conversation a little bit. I want to stay in leadership, but I want us to talk a little bit about how technology is changing the way we lead. How do you see technology changing the, the challenge or creating new challenges uh, for the leader? In today's world, data becomes a critical aspect of success. You need to be able to get data quickly. You need to be able to get data on your business, on your management, on all the things that you're doing. Now, after you've been doing it for a long time, you do develop sort of an intuitive sense. I don't need to know every single balance in all my accounts. I don't need to know all these things because intuitively I just kind of know. I, you, you, you develop this that over time. Fine. That fine. I've got plenty there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just get this sense of it and you just know. And it's like, you know, I don't need to be in the meeting to know what's happening in the meeting. Even though, you know, I'm a major shareholder in a company that I'm not on the board of, for example. I know what's going on generally at the company. No one has to tell me what's happening in the company. And you develop that intuitive sense just like a parent knows a child. But as a leader in today's world, you need to be able to realize that changes can come and blindside you from different vectors and positions that have never heretofore been contemplated. And that's the challenge of today's world and why the pace is seemingly so rapid today. So I think that's a, that's a very unique uh, sort of artifact of today's world. And I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon. And so leaders that are leading in this high tech environment have got to not just get comfortable, but they have to start using data. They have to get very comfortable with data and start speaking the language of number as if, you know, like I'll be meeting sometimes with the CFO of one of our companies in the portfolio. And if he doesn't know the numbers cold, I will literally say, why don't you have all of this memorized? Because if you're living it, you would. And that's an expectation that I set. Now, I don't say it more difficultly than that. It's just that, but they know that in the next meeting they come in, I expect that they actually know the numbers cold. And I mean a lot of the numbers too. If you really are living it and you're really into it and you're not just sort of like talking about it, like throwing popcorn from the cheap seats, you know your business. Absolutely. So we have time for what we call the final word. Okay. This is your chance to give Final pearl of wisdom, final piece of advice to an aspiring leader. This could be your final word, maybe your final word about leadership. The most important aspect of leadership, I believe, it was not on the list of three, and it's the precursor, the prerequisite to those three even, is believing in yourself. Believe in yourself. Don't listen to all the negative self-narrative that you give to yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. When you look in the mirror, it's like, oh, I don't, I'm not, you know, thin enough, or I'm, my hair is falling out, or whatever. All these things, leave them all aside and realize your own self-worth. You're perfect just as you are. And you can accomplish anything you set your mind to. The only real obstacles you face in this world are the ones you allow yourself to persistently believe. That's terrific, and that's a, that's a great place to stop. Robert, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Really appreciate having you. Thank you, great to be here. Now, if you have a question or need advice, connect with us by email, leadership at fullerton.edu, or on Instagram at CSUFCFL. Well, this has been a great thought-provoking show. Thank you to our featured guest, Robert Edward Grant, a true Renaissance man. 
Join us each episode of The Leadership Voice, where your leadership journey is our mission. I'm Jay Barbuto, and on behalf of the Center for Leadership at Cal State Fullerton, we'll see you next time right here on The Leadership Voice. Thank you.